Hi there. Um, thank you so much for joining again for one of my writers recommends from the book room. Um, I'm really delighted today to have Emma Forrest with me. Hi, Emma. Hello. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. <laughs> and um, and so just for a little recap. Yeah, I know I say this every time to people who are tuned in. So if they've watched every single one, this is going to get very boring. But I have asked writers who I admire and work that they've done that I've loved um, to put together a curation for the book room of their favourite books within the genre. So Emma has put together four books for you on the topic of women, really, writing on obsession. And they are such, it's such an eclectic mix. So I'm really excited for you to talk them through with us. Um, but so, so the books that she's picked are things that, for example, she's pressed into the hands of others that have perhaps been pressed into her hands by other people that she admires, the ones that she goes back to in her own work, um, the real finds, real contemporary finds, and also classics as well. And that's the great thing about these curations that people just have such a great mix of contemporary and classic. So there we go. We're all caught up. So Emma, we can start now. Well, um, the, the important thing is that I have no copies of any of these books in the house. Oh. It means no, 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 no. This is proof of love. This means any book that I can talk about that isn't here is a book that I've immediately pressed and quite. Yeah. yeah. Well, luckily I have them all. You do. Right okay. Here. So please talk me through my own books. <laughs> yeah. And then I'll speak about them. Yeah, so first on. of all, let's talk about your book. So we have this. Yeah. um here busy being free I just absolutely love this cover it's just so cool yeah. um and it's been very popular in the shop oh, um a... and it's a I tell you what I find as a new indie bookseller yeah is that it's a I find it quite hard to contain because there's just so much going on so when I'm talking to people about this book it's it's hard because on one level yeah okay it's about the breakdown of your marriage and your yeah. life changing and returning to England from living yeah. in LA but on the other level it's about so much more as you know some of our best uh, contemporary non-fiction is well and and classic non-fiction so yeah. could you just tell us a little bit about this book and its creation and and what it means to you yeah I mean the the um the high concept that you can tell I, I, I've been working in Hollywood, the high concept cell of the book is that having lived my life guided by romantic obsession, romantic impulse, it dictated the towns I lived in, the countries I lived in, the clothes I bought and hoarded, the air tickets I paid for, um, hair color, you know, like <laughs> someone who likes red hair, someone likes blonde, dictated all of that. When I filed for divorce in midlife, like having been just about to hit 40, I made a vow of celibacy because it was the one thing I hadn't tried since I'd become sexually active as a teenager. Mm -hmm. um, and I filed for divorce right when Trump was elected to office. I was living in America and those two events became quite intertwined in my mm. mind. So yeah. the time frame I set myself was that I would not have sex. I wouldn't date. I wouldn't hold, I didn't hold hands with anyone except my child mm -hmm. until Trump was out of office. And I kept that uh, vow. And that's what the book is about and the knock-on effects of it, what I learned about myself. The knock-on effects, weirdly, that it had on other people in my life. Mm. My mom, um, on my kid, mm. on my ex-husband. Mm. Um, it really, it threw people, um, but it really opened me up. And that's what the book's about. I mean, I think a lot of women can resonate with, and men, I think, I don't think it's a female thing. Yeah. Um, in fact, I was just discussing with my friend at the weekend of what a chameleon her ex-husband is and that, you know, every woman that he goes for, we see exactly the reason he's going for it, what he gains out of it, what yeah. he then takes away and where he yeah. moves on to. Yeah. So I think it's it's a very human thing to um, to gravitate towards those things that are perhaps missing and then to take on some of those characteristics of those people. So I think that that makes your book really relatable. Good. Yeah, that idea of like wanting to absorb by osmosis, you know, choosing. Mm. I always chose 
the male partners that I'd want to be if I was a dude. Right. Like the things those guys got away with, the things right. that they, the, the, the chutzpah to demand, you know, I was like, yeah. I want that for myself. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. it didn't transfer by osmosis. So then no. you're left with, okay, I guess I have to do it myself. Yeah. And that was uh, really challenging and great. It's interesting as well, because I think we're similar age and our daughters are a similar age as well. Yeah. But also, you know, you spent time in that, um you know world in the music world and yeah. and um, that kind of celebrity world and also in that similar age in that 20 in our 20s yeah. when we were told that we could behave like men and that we could get away with it yeah. and actually I'm not sure what that did apart from allow men to get away with far more yeah that's an interesting generational thing uh, my funny thing about uh, probably one aspect of the reason I ended up leaving England for America is that I never drank ever. Um, I mean, like I've had drinks in my life. I probably, I probably to this day will have like three drinks in a year. It's just not my thing. So that ladder culture thing, um, I felt very outside Mm. of. um, And I actually remember reconnecting with someone who knew me back in the day who was like, you were always standing on tables so out of it. I was like, I didn't drink. I was nuts. Like I was, that's pure. That was not alcohol. That was just like mania. Mm. Um, I've definitely think uh, I gravitated to that, Calif- you know, the, the California ability to have a social life without alcohol. Like that actually was something that I found intimidating about coming back to live. I don't go into it that much in the book. I don't think I mention it. But then um, I, I was wracked with nerves about coming back into that in England because it's so mm. key to British culture. Mm, yeah. And the other thing as well <clears throat> in, in terms of the book is finding yourself in a place in your 40s that you hadn't mapped out for yourself. Like actually, you know, finding yourself single in your attic flat, which always yeah. sounds to me like the L, you know, um, Lynn Reed Banks, the L-shaped room, but I'm sure it's much oh. <laughs> much more glamorous than that but um you know I think we can we can all relate to that as well because yeah it feels like the apex is sort of the wrong way round. we were meant yeah. to build up to something and yes. actually, what, yeah, what yeah, yeah, yeah 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 but I do also say in there and I really believe it I, I don't I realized I don't need much space so long as I have a big view and that may just be the writer in me and also in fairness that's not the same for a child like mm. that's that right there is the struggle between writer and motherhood because I mm. looked at that fact I was like this is absolutely perfect and then there's a lockdown and a six-year-old and you're like oh I didn't think this through we really did need outdoor space <laughs> but yeah there's always that struggle and that's sort of key to the book as well I guess is like how to be a mother and still keep your romantic life alive and by romantic life I don't mean with someone else I mean the life of romance that I enjoy alone yeah nice that's nice because I think that we often um sort of judge as women I'm sure as men I don't mean to like leave guys out but like we do judge ourselves through the eyes of others constantly so this period that you had of focusing on yourself and your child meant that you you took that you know took that away from yourself and you could see yourself yeah you are and what you are rather than reflected back to you by through somebody else's eyes yeah Yeah. and how and how was that how cathartic was it for you I mean I know you've written you know plenty of books before and screenplays and so writing is very familiar to you but did, did this book in particular putting it all into this and containing it as a vessel how cathartic was that for you well there's always what I love about writing memoir because I've written novels and I've written memoir is the literal putting on a shelf Mm. of difficult feelings Mm. so it's it's the writing is great for me but also the physical action of Mm. putting it away like Mm. closing it between hardback pages is um, for me something of a magic spell. You just give it back to the universe and you're like, hopefully this is gonna help someone else. We're done here. You know, that's why it's working. Yeah, it's nice to hear you say that because sometimes I feel that as women, when we write our experiences, it can ironically be 
turn back on us as an obsession with the subject rather than a processing and a putting away. Um, you know, and I've had this in my experience as well, that if you write about something that happened to you, it's like, oh, she just can't let it go. Or, you yeah. know, she's just dragging it out. Or, she, you know, wanting to stay connected rather than actually, like you say, moving on. Well, that can I use that as a segue into a first book? Well, you exactly. Do, I was thinking that as well. Yeah. yeah. Are we going to talk about this one, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Eve Babbitt's. So yeah, this is Eve Babbitt's Slow Days Fast Company, The World, The Flesh and LA. So go on, tell us about this so, one. Eve Babbitt, that was republished, I think, by the New York Review of Books. Yeah. Um, Eve Babbitt's um, is now getting her due. Um, she wrote kind of hybrid memoir novels through the 70s. Um, she's a spectacular literary stylist like her style is just so dreamy and evocative and casts such a spell but she's a rare mix because she's an incredible stylist who happens to have amazing adventures to write mm -hmm. about like mm -hmm. you don't get always get both of them yeah. she had the most amazing radar for talent basically um she was really interesting to me because she was both groupian rock star herself like essentially she had affairs with Jim Morrison young Steve Martin before he was huge young Harrison Ford when he was her pot dealer um who else uh it's just the, the book is absolutely littered with like the mo like her taste in men is extraordinary they're extraordinary powerfully you know energetically powerful men but she matches them um and she really even though I'm sure Phoebe Waller-Bridge probably hasn't read her stuff I imagine Michaela Cole probably doesn't know her stuff she's still something of a cult figure it's one of those funny things where even without Phoebe Waller-Bridge knowing her she is in the DNA DNA of right. Fleabag Right. Of the second season of Fleabag, in that she was Eve was so ahead of her time in writing about what is dismissed as women's stuff, writing about the magic and power and um, spell casting of the perfect hair cut, mm -hmm. you know, which she does in Fleabag, um, of about romantic obsession as religious experience. Mm -hmm. um, the writing's just so beautiful, and I can't imagine that anyone who loves what Phoebe Waller-Bridge does wouldn't get something big out of Eve Babbitt's, and that book is a good place to start. Right, and because it's basically, um, it's a work of auto-fiction, right? Exactly, um, yeah. So, and she had this... Um, love affair and it's a book that she wrote in the 60s 60, 70s 70s yeah, yeah. So 74 I and think. The, and this love affair rather than let it just um kind of uh sizzle out she wrote yeah. a whole book about it so love affairs you know like there's myriad love affairs in right. there but she's just as turned on by her city as she is by the man she's obsessed with like she's obsessed with los angeles and i think living in uh europe people are have sort of just a Beverly Hills 90210 view of LA often mm. but it's a re I've lived there. I lived there for 10 years and it's such a strange magical place mm. and she's so fed by the weirdness of that city and you really like you can smell it you can feel it it's um it's just it's it's textural it's a really textural book I cannot recommend it enough yeah and and like we were saying you know she's a woman writing about love and owning it um yeah. in a way that you can't accuse her of being oh come on just move on and just you know it's she's she's owning it's, it's her it's her mm. heart mm. Yeah. yeah great okay so that's your first one yes. where shall we go next have you got a choice? Um, you tell me you do the segue well next on my pile should we just do it that way yeah which is bang up contemporary oh cash Right, Cash is, so Cash Caraway, Skin Estate. Cash is about to explode because Skin Estate, she has adapted, this is her memoir, 
she's adapted um, as a series for BBC and HBO. It's called Rain Dogs, the adaptation. And it stars Daisy, um, what's she called? Daisy May, May Cooper. Cooper. Daisy May yeah. Cooper as her. Um, and it's Cash's true story of just trying to keep her and her daughter off the streets. Um, yeah. The difficulty of trying to rent when you have no rental history um it's one of my favorite sort of peculiar peculiar things in her story is that the only one who'll take a chance and rent to her is an 80s pop star who went back and bought the council flat that he grew up in right um, i'm not going to name him because she doesn't name him in the book but he is one of your favorite 80s pop stars is okay. that it's a risk gets them you know into safe housing right. um, and that's what the memoir is about it's just sort of a love story between her and her daughter and her obsession with providing a very reasonable obsession with providing a roof over her head it's interesting as well because obviously this curation is about women right on obsession but like you said this obsession is the love between her and her daughter and what she'll go to to yeah. ensure her daughter has a roof over her head and yeah. and they're not homeless um Whereas the um, the love in Eve Babbitts is like, like you said, the love of the city, sexual. but also the love, yeah. the sexual love with these yeah. men. Yeah. Um, and there's one book that's been really popular and started out so many times um, in the shop called Conversations on Love by Natasha oh, Love. Oh, yeah, which is about all these different types of love yeah. that we experience. Yeah. And yeah. so when you say love, you know, yeah. you often think of romantic love, but yeah. love and obsession in terms of keeping your child safe. Yeah, is is something that the minute that you know they're placed in your arms, you're going to be yeah. obsessed with, right? She, she's a link to Eve Babbitts in a strange way because she has such a strong authorial voice, such a strong writing style, and she happens to have lived a very rich story to tell. Mm. Yeah. Right. But yeah, yeah, you know, like the story matches the writing style and it's right. magic yeah. so I, I wonder so when is her um what's Soon, it the show starts, yeah I think I've seen it over on on social media but I think it maybe it's in the new year yeah I think it's in the new year yeah, yeah. I mean I only have actually this is the last copy I have left in the shop uh, actually of oh. both of these so um, I'll need to do some restocking this week but yes. yeah that's going to be hugely popular so yeah. then the next one yeah is this one Oh, Delicacy. I don't Katie Woods. Okay, so now this is a really cool thing that goes, it's a nice thing about writers, lady writers. I don't think guys do this. Okay. So I became friendly with Cash Carraway after I read her memoir. I wrote her a fan letter and we became friendly. I just wrote her about how much I adored her book. I read Katie's book because she wrote me a note about how okay. much I loved Busy Being Free. Um, and she very humbly said may I possibly send you my memoir and I said sure wait hang on are you the girl from Stathlet's Flats wait that's one of my favorite shows that show has been my total comfort through all of the lockdowns so Katie's a great comic actress who works all the time you'll absolutely know her if not from Stathlet's Flats and from a million other things so then the shock of getting in the post this book that is like slam dunk, one of the best debut books I have ever read in my oh, life. Wow. Like her literary gift is, because it's different. I've done, I've done screenplays and I've done books and it's a different sort of skill set and you don't necessarily have both. Um, and the fact that she has this amazing, rich, textured, complex, really sad but really beautiful and of course funny voice just like I was almost ashamed that she'd read my book because I was so blown away by her <laughs> and um, it's a memoir told through cake that's the backbone of it is that each chapter is memories um, that come to the surface through a different slice of cake um, and ultimately and uh, amongst and around grief and career and sex and longing um an obsession with eating that's very very disordered and that uh, unfortunately most women can relate to 
Mm. Yeah, and how one feeds the other, quite frankly. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think in terms Have you of, read it? I haven't read this one yet, no. I um I mean for me as a as a fi- non-fiction writer yeah. in my day job, um, I think that um the concept for non-fiction is is one of the most important things to get yeah. right. Yeah. Um yeah. And and the, then the, that becoming the vehicle for the storytelling yeah. just can make a book absolutely fly. Yeah. And so it's an interesting concept for me to hear about from you that she has um, she explores all these feelings through that structure yeah. and using cake. Well, you know, we there, there's the cliched term eating your feelings, and mm. she really um, excavates that in quite an extraordinary way. And I think when you, yeah, like when you wrote to me about it, you were saying that she, ha- there's not really one t- topic that she doesn't tackle in this no, book. she gets to go through everything. But as I say, the the unfortunate backbone that all of us, I think, can get is an obsession with food that's very disordered. Mm. And I say that rather than an eating disorder. Yeah. I think most of us have disordered eating. Most women yeah. do to some extent. Yeah. 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 Okay, great. Thanks. For that. I really, really want to read this. You know, somebody said to me that the problem with opening a bookshop is that you don't get to read as much. Yeah. And that that is a that's frustrating for me because I hear about all these books that you guys recommend. I'm like, oh, yeah. I haven't read that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I want to read it, but when yeah. you have this idea, this romantic idea that you sit reading books while no. you know, <laughs> it happen like that. Um, so then our last, well, your last one. Yes. Lasta. Lasta. Yeah. Again, like, I it, I cannot believe this is a debut. Mm. She's very young. I, I have I have to I have to double check, but she's in her mid twenties, I believe. Yeah. Maybe she's in her late twenties now. It is um, a novel. Mm-hmm. Um, if you were gonna sell it in a sentence, you'd say it was about sexual obsession which it is, but it's also sexual obsession refracted through the lens of race, youth, um, career, power dynamics, the desire to be an artist. Mm-hmm. Um, she is a protege, or I believe her professor was Zadie Smith. Um, right. She's just an amazing writer. She has my favorite thing, which is, um, saying what she means to say in as few words as possible. Like I think the real, um, my real bugbear with fate, oh, can you pause it? That was my doorbell. Well, well we can- yeah. Wait I can... one second, I'll be back. You Will you talk? You talk I will, I will talk. <laughs> um, okay, sorry about that. This is a new one for the book room. We've not had this before, but uh, we'll just, uh, oh, she, she. No, she's not going. I'll just fill time showing you these gorgeous spines. I mean, this is what I really love about these curations in that you get such an amazing mix. Um, I asked Emma to um, do this curation. She was the one who wanted to pick on obsession, but all the different types of obsession, you know, from a, a parental love to a sexual love to a, you know, a love of food. Um, and then this love of city and place and all of these things actually are very important in terms of writing um memoir what I was just saying about structure and concept um in terms of non-fiction like it's really um the difference between getting a book published and not in terms of what you do for concept and how you structure your book you can have the same story real real writer life Ah, real writer life. Was Sorry it about that, postman. Uh, okay. I did. I did some really good filling, like I'm a sort of like morning TV person. Good, perfect. Like um, okay, right back in there. Last of Raven Leilani. Um, I get this really funny thing with writers where I don't ever get um, writer envy with especially with female authors, I get this thing where I just want to stand up and cheer. Like, I was so excited when- Or be best friends with them. I mean, it's, 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 it's that perfect book because it's so much fun. It's such a pleasure to read, but absolutely it's a literary novel. 
the literary merit is 100% there. It's philosophical, funny, moving, really sexy. Actually, like, usually sex scenes are so grim, mortifying, has a deliberately so, and then sometimes suddenly actually sexy. Um, I just, I, it, 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 what I love about it is it feels like one of those books that just flew into her life, like just with wings, like it was just born. But I know, you know, like it wasn't like that. She worked her ass off, but to end up with something that feels just, you know, like it has wings to it. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. And, and there's a lot of, there's been a kind of trend for these women in their young, their mid twenties writing about life in a way that I'm not sure that, I don't know that I would have had. We're not that. there yet. Okay, so I'm glad you said that because I have seen a few of them, read a few, you know, I'm terrible because I'll stand in the, no, I'm not terrible. I, I stand by how I do this. I'll go into a bookshop and I'll read the first page and I'll read the last page. Right. Okay. And I'll either be like, I'm in or no and yeah there's books by women in their 20s writing about love where I'm like you're not there yet because you haven't had enough distance to make sense of it and yeah there isn't enough self-awareness or reflection and that what that that's what just like really stunned me about Raven's writing is that to to have the immediacy feel like you're in it but also to have wisdom on it I don't know how it's possible yeah that's um, that's the um that is the magic, like you say. And I was going to ask you actually um, about in terms of writing so close to the bone, because it is really hard. It is really hard to have had these experiences and then get that close to the bone to to, you know, reform and reshape them and pin them to the page. Yeah. Um, and, and that involves a certain distance as well. Yeah. So I wondered if you'd found that. I mean, maybe the fit, ge geographical distance helped for you mm -hmm. as well. I here's my gift as a writer I don't expect it to be good for a while like I, I I I'm very happy for the first draft to be pretty messy and then to make it work in the next draft you know and I love the edit hmm. I love cutting I think that comes from a teenage life as a journalist is I actually like cutting words I like like I say what I admire about her book is saying what you mean to say in as few words as possible so I really enjoy the edit I love knowing that it's not till the second draft that it's going to be anywhere approaching greatness mm. Mm. Um, whereas I think a lot of writers want it to be great by the time they're getting it onto the page and so they knock something out of it in that process yeah I, yeah I definitely have for me now I feel I write sort of fast in that first edit to kind of yeah. keep the air in the balloon and keep the energy and then yeah. edit slowly. Yeah, that's the way to do it, I think. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. that's such an amazing selection. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm so happy for your shop success. Well, yeah. I mean, it's building week by week. So we'll yeah. see. We'll see. But I want to um, come see you there. Yeah, definitely. I'll have to. Um, well, when's the paperback out? May 25th. Okay. Yeah, so that would be a year, right? Or was it, yeah. did it come out in July? No. Yeah, July it came out. No, it came out in August. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, we'll sign off and say thank goodbye you. to our viewers. Yes. Um, but thank you so much for joining. And it's been really wonderful to hear your selection. Thank you for having me. Enjoy.